Go ahead with that. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so Monica had asked, uh, despite the or in light of the cool diversity, we've got we actually have a contract school. Chicago Tech Academy is a contract school, which is sort of like somewhere between a neighborhood high school and a charter school. Okay. Um, it kind of has some aspects. Probably like a district charter here in California. Yeah. Yeah. which is a Noble Street um, yeah. charter school. And then we have Mike from uh, a Cristo Rey School, Cristo Rey St. Martin up in Waukegan. And then we have Mary Rose from uh, Josephinum Academy, which is an all-girls Catholic school that just got approved recently to do uh, international baccalaureate. So we have yeah. all three sectors represented. And, uh, but I mean, all high schools. So Monica was asking, what, um, what unites the group? What do you guys all sort of share in common despite your diversity? Yeah, so Matt, Matt gave one answer about you guys really want to see students engaged um, in work. I think it's related to Matt's answer. It was um, you guys kind of serve the same students, just different kind of uh, school structures, as, as Jen, Jen just pointed out, in terms of public, you know, um, whether you're a, a contractor starter or a or conventional um, approved school, and then private. So, so probably diversity of your population unites you, wanting to engage kids in learning. What else? I think wanting to stay um, relevant for students is, you know, engaging, but also practices and understanding what's what's going to push this forward and not being stagnant with our students and their learning. Because they're changing and evolving, and society's changing and evolving, and so right. our schools are too. Okay. Yeah, I was to piggyback off of that. I was going to say I think every school here shows a commitment to growth, yeah. um, you know, a desire to be innovative in the ways in which we are reaching our students. Um, we're not doing the same thing over and over again in right. light of the fact that there isn't results with the same thing over and over again. So I think we're all kind of looking to figure out what's the best path for our kids, and we're not afraid to kind of take some risks with that or be a little creative if needed. Right. Kind of like always be able to raise it to the next level. Mm -hmm. So uh, Monica, hi, I just chat again. Uh, you know, I, I've been, you know, going through this XQ process and, and had some, I don't know, it seems like the last couple of mornings in the shower I've had these all the way. So I don't know, the shower is becoming my sanctity for sanity and uh, new thought. Really cracking at this innovative model for our kids, but I got to thinking this morning. Like we did all this work on this XQ on this in cool innovation that I think could could be one of the top five. Um, okay. But I'm also now thinking about like um, you know adult learning a lot and how you know the the, the t tried and true sort of PD that we've been giving teachers the last 20 years is that really effective? And so if, if we're asking kids and we're trying to do innovation with kids. Like, should we be a little more innovative with our PD for teachers because they're the ones delivering that work to kids, right? And so I've yeah. always, I've always believed that adult learning, if adults aren't learning, kids aren't learning. And so, yeah. and so I've just been thinking a little bit about that too, and, and sort of I didn't. Um, that was my big question for you today was a, a little bit about some of these schools and what adult learning looks like at those schools. I know some of that's in the book, but you know, I just was curious. Yeah, well, and I think it does connect exactly back to um, your ability to have that um, that focus on growth, iteration, innovation, all of that. I think that, that ties hand in hand to what you guys just said as well. Other comments anybody want to add? Or Jen, do you want to add from your perspective, the, the leader, the Chicago leader of schools that can? Well, my one thought is that um, kind of reminds me back of the days when I was leading a teacher ed program um, that we are asking teachers to teach in ways that they were not taught. I mean, maybe a couple of them got lucky and they had great project-based learning experiences or they had really innovative schools, but for the most part, we know, especially a lot of folks who go into teaching, go into teaching because they did well in a traditional school environment and are sort of recreating that at some level. And so I do think the adult learning question um, is, is I think one of the most important questions because we ha how do we and if we're just delivering kind of you know rote lecture base you know if our pedagogy of our PD is totally does not reflect what we're asking people to do then we're not being consistent you know it's like walk your talk right but it's hard but that's part of the point is that it's hard to 
you have people be designers, and it's hard. So I think that, that we need to not lose sight of that. We can't lecture people into... Yeah. Well, um... ...learning outcomes, right? But it's, yeah. it's hard. It's hard. Well, and, and you know, I, I would say that when I start writing the book, yeah, I wasn't sure where we were going to go with the book. I mean, it was really as, like, let's just go to these schools and see what we find. I mean, we had clear questions. I think... Um, I think we thought it was going to be more about implementation, and, and it ended up not being about that, as you guys know. It ended up being more about inspiring and showing what's possible. But I think um, probably what surprised me, and maybe had been a bit more agnostic about before, was you know the whole like idea of a professional learning community, a professional school, right? And you know you guys have um, you know the Tony Bright stuff from forever ago, and you know the trust and. The book that he wrote, I can't remember with whom, around trust. I think it's when he was at the Chicago Consortium. Yeah, and so um, cool. yeah, and then Jen, you know, worked with uh, I think Mildred McLaughlin, who did a lot of the stuff on professional learning communities. But you know, Hewlett and others would ask me if there's one thing we had to do tomorrow, what would it be? And I'd say, you just have to kind of flatten the hierarchy of the school and create this true organic uh, professional learning community. And so that's, that's a simple answer. That, that takes two to work. If you don't have that, you're never going to get to everything you guys just talked about. But with that is is the role of the principal, right? And so it really is that that condition number two around um, around the fact that teachers function as professionals in a collaborative. Way. And and you know if you can't get that one right, if you can't start there, then really what the theory of action is saying is you're never going to go anywhere else with change. And and so that alone takes forever to create, and but that is the place to start. And and I and and the, I was glad to have the um, planning guide that I could actually um, write because I felt like in the book I couldn't say how you get there, and I couldn't kind of capture the the breadth and depth of um, how these teachers worked in partnership with each other, with the students and the principal. And so you know, it's oversimplified what we say in terms of it is a community, it is a professional learning community, you know, the principal has to be an instructional leader, all those things that no policymaker likes to hear because it's too hard to mandate and legislate because it's heart, soul, and mind, right? That That's the game changer. And, um, and you know, we can certainly talk a lot about school culture because that's important. Um, but as one teacher said to me, um, if you don't empower students, you can never expect to empower your teachers, right? Or if you don't empower teachers, you can never expect to empower students. Mm -hmm. And and so to me, the real game changer is empowering your teachers, treating them with the trust and the professionalism that they deserve and that we've kind of um, attacked and minimized over the last few years um, as we talk about school reform and the focus has moved to teachers. And, and it's that nurturing them, it's the growing them, and it's helping them have that growth mindset that it's not about failure and that they're allowed to experiment. And, you know, there's a lot of criticism about whether assessment took that permission away, right? Um, which, you know, sure, you can go ahead and, and blame some of that on assessment, but, but not all of it. But so if your teachers don't have that mindset that it's okay to, that they're trusted, but it's also okay to try things differently, then, then you're kind of never getting to this space that you guys are talking about with regard to um, innovation and and kind of iteration and and growing as a school. So that, that's kind of the simple answer um, in terms of, of if you guys really want to be innovative. I think th the other part that I always think about that is um, is how involved they have been in, in your work right now in terms of leadership, right? And so it really is sharing responsibility with them. But but the other thing I always say to schools is is if your if your teachers aren't critical thinkers, if your teachers don't understand the concepts behind the academic disciplines, if your teachers aren't collaborative, if your teachers aren't effective communicators, you know, if your teachers don't have, you know, a good mindset, if your teachers aren't self directed, then how would you ever think your students are going to be there? Um, and so, so it, it's it's kind of maybe an unusual statement to say that you have to start with your teacher. So going back to I think Jen's point or whoever was asking about professional development, some studies have come out that have shown that outside external drive-by or sit and get professional development ha is ineffective. 
there's a study, I think, by Rand or AIR. I'm sure they don't like that I get their brand messed up. But that showed traditional professional development isn't doing it, right? Um, there's a new report, I think, that just came out from Learning Forward about um, professional communities. Um, but we really have to transition, and this is the difference of all these schools, is all of their professional learning was teacher-directed. You know, whether it was identifying what professional development they needed or if it was giving the professional development. Um, and when I say identify, I say, hey, this is what we need, instead of the district or the principal telling them, this is what I think you need. Um, and then maybe they would be participatory in identifying the provider. So it wasn't saying you can't have a provider come in and help us with our professional learning. But it had to be something the teacher zoned in terms of what they needed. So again, just like with students, right? So I'm not going to learn if I don't think I need it, right? Um, so, so that's, you know, the first part is teacher directed is about them identifying what they need to know and do um, to be better with their teaching. And, um, and then, you know, using teachers as, as, as fellow professional development providers within the school, outside the school. Um, I'm sure, you know, Chicago Tech, what's so cool about High Tech High, you know, there's a lot of cool things. Um, and, and a lot of people think that High Tech High is not replicable because it's all about the teachers, but that's because that's the system they created. But you have teachers giving professional development to other schools. You know, um, their school is structured. So they, they have study groups that are teacher-led. Um, so we're, we're getting probably really way ahead of ourselves, but I know like when Hewlett would say, you know, when I was writing the book, what do you see most? I said, you're not going to like the answer, but it, it's really going to, it's creating that collaborative professional community within a school. And, um, and that's not easy to, to achieve. And I'm glad to see there's a lot of people who are creating that policy, but, but it's, 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 um, so it's a cultural norm, as somebody kind of raised before, in terms of how we treat our teachers and how we, we work with our teachers. And then the other number one thing that I always say that people don't like, right, like everyone's always looking for, what's that one thing, you know, and, and it really does come down to um, you have to know your students. And, and so it comes down to the old days of the Gates Foundation of, um, of relationships, right? And, um, and that's particularly important at the high school level. And so I know like at Science Leadership Academy, I can't even remember if it's in the book anymore, but, but Mino, who now works at the Gates Foundation, one of the teachers, you know, she'd always say that, that Chris, the principal, taught them to say, you know, when you ask a high school teacher, what do you teach? They say English, you know, or science or math or whatever your subject is. That's what a high school teacher says. But if you ask someone at Science Leadership Academy, what do you teach? They say, well, I teach students math. I teach students English. And, and so it's, it's, again, kind of going back to some of maybe the Nellie May focus of student-centered. But in high school, we've been subject-centered and teacher-centered. So it's moving that to be about students. So in the end, if you really just stripped everything away, learning's around rela learning is about relationships. You know, the relationships that teachers have with the principal and with each other and the relationships that they have with students. But you've got to create that first layer of those teachers being able to even have relationships with each other. You know, like, um, I think this one is in the book, Nancy from um, Casco Bay, um, you know, she said, if you if you want to go to school, go to if you want to work at a school where you kind of walk in the back door, go into your classroom, shut the door, do your four to six, you know, courses that day, you know, have your lunch in your room while you're preparing, and then you just walk out and you haven't talked to another single teacher the rest of the day, then this isn't the school for you. And I'm sure if I asked you guys, how many teachers do you know who have that daily experience? Hopefully not in your school. <laughs> but where they really don't have to interact with the rest of their teachers on a substantive um, academic content level, nonetheless social, then then she's like, you can't work at our school. You wouldn't be happy because it's that collaborative, right? So yeah. that's kind of um, probably putting the cart before the horse, but just kind of addressing some of your kind of top issues that came up about wanting to have this mindset and focus on always growing. Um, you know, um, uh, Avalon is a great example about always growing. I did the, um, I piloted the planning guide with them in another school there in Minneapolis. And it's so funny because the school that really needed a lot of help, they scored themselves really high on all four conditions. You know, particularly the, the school culture and, um, and the professional kind of teacher culture, the, the collaborative culture for teachers. And, um, and, and Avalon, which is a teacher-run school, you know, and students learn through independent projects, 
they scored themselves lower. And the reason why they did that is because they're always working to improve. And so nothing's ever good enough for them, right? They always see ways they can be better. And so that kind of goes back again to the mindset you guys want your schools to have. And so if you're working collaboratively like that, you're always going, yeah, that didn't work so well, did it? You know, oh, God, we could do better with that, or we could do better with this kid. You know, um, one of my best examples was at King Middle School, like when I wrote the book, um, you know, they were doing that windmill, the, the wind turbine um, project where you learn how to actually generate electricity after you've kind of done some work in science, you've done some work in your design class. Um, you know, the culminative project is this wind turbine. Well, you know, the teachers work in teams there constantly, and so they look at each other one day and they go, you know, this isn't enough. We have a lot of kids who are from you know, North Africa, and even though we're acknowledging that by the book that we're reading in terms of no energy and, and gen and maybe they weren't reading that book then, um, but, you know, we're, we're not really giving them a relevant activity. We need to redo this project. And so now, and it's on the PBS video, and I show this at a lot of workshops, the kids are actually now having to um, create products that generate power um, through different devices. That is, if I was living as if I was living in a third world country. So one student create she can generate power or something like that with this little scrub thing she made that you're cleaning, and you can generate power from it. You know, um, you guys have seen how if you if you ride a bike, you generate power from that. So it's basically saying, how would I power up a phone if I was living in a third world country? And they change that project over time to reflect the changing demographics of their school. So again, just kind of harping on, on, on what you guys have identified as important in terms of having this growth and innovative and continuous improvement mindset is that if you create that community of teachers where they're trusted and respected and treated as professionals and empowered to do what they need to do that are aligned to your school values, they're going to constantly challenge themselves to innovate, to improve, um, so that's kind of just, we should probably back into whatever kind of, well, I have an agenda from <laughs> from, Jen, from from Jennifer, but um, we should probably back into some maybe more of those questions, but just hearing you guys, um, that's the biggest change and shift you can make in your schools to start. Monica, can you, um, we all have in front of us a copy of the Theory of Action, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, you've referenced the importance of the second step, which is um, creating that professional and collaborative community. I think that, you know, I mean, in order for schools to be part of schools that can, you know, they're either high performing or high potential, you know, we have visited them, they're interested in collaborating. So there, I mean, I, I think that, you know, schools in our network hopefully um, have already made some progress on, right. you know, number one and number two. But I just thought, you know, this this theory of action is, is sequential on purpose. Right. And so I just was hoping maybe you could kind of lead us through it, it a little bit so people see how the steps interconnect. And yeah. then well, then you know, it was, it was interesting. folks assess yeah. on okay. So, yeah. And be able to assess, yeah. Have you, have you guys, can you remind me? I think you've started to do some of the assessments, right? Um, we have not yet. Okay, okay cool. All right, yeah. So it was, it was funny because um, I feel like I know you all well since I know Jen. <laughs> just be more honest. But... I struggled with the first two um, the first two parts of the condition. So the first one is create a strong school culture, right? And everything I have as examples in there are focused on students, right? And making sure that students are trusted and respected. And and you know, so you know, it basically says you have you have to start with that. And and how the theory of action, I think Jen, are you the one who called it a tree the other day? It's like, is it a tree? Oh yeah, I forgot it is a tree. But but if you look at the actual visual depiction of the theory of action, and it's actually towards the front of the planning guide, if you guys have it, it's like um, right after the, the user's guide where it acknowledges the authors. I don't know if there's a page number. Isn't that funny? Are there really no page numbers? And all of them are just my guide. Um, after how the guide is organized, um, there's a big picture of it, and I have my black and white copy out today because I think someone took my... you guys have that anywhere? Yeah, the web, the web, ver the the version of the planning guide that you gave me that I produced has a half page theory, but I gave them all a physical handout of what you're holding up. Okay. Yeah, it's, this one's actually at the beginning of it. That's why it's like the half page one is is um, she put the theory of change at the beginning of the planning guide, not with the um, not with the actual theory of action. But anyway, so so it's it's really kind of um, the visualization. This is what you guys have, so that's why it, this is not a good one. Oops, sorry, <laughs> that's not a good one. But we have, it doesn't we have this one. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's they, what I'm looking at. Great. Okay. So, um, so if you, it, it really is sequential to what Jen said, but also if you look at it, it's like foundational too, right? And so when I was working with this, uh, the, the graphic artist, I said, you know, not only do I need to show it's iterative, I need to show that you, you build on top of each other. And I really like the graph she came up with because in some ways, and I, I, I told her I don't want you to do this, but but I think about construction, maybe because I have the sheet metal worker, I have no clue why I think about construction because I don't do it. But, you know, you have to lay that strong foundation, right? And if you don't lay the strong foundation, then, you know, the two-by-fours and the framing of the house will never work. You know, ground shifts a little bit here in California, earthquakes, somewhere else, you know, too much water, ice, you know, contraction, expansion then your house is going to fall apart. And so you have to create that strong school culture. But the first theory really focuses on students. And I was probably also deeply biased, as, as Jen knows, is that I used to run the New Tech Network. And, um, and the coaches would really, you know, I kept saying, but what are we really doing the first year to change instruction, right? Because I wanted to see faster change, better change, right? To, kind of to someone's point is like, you know, we have to focus on, on growth and accountability too. Um, but, you know, the coaches would say, you know, Monica, if we can't get this first layer down, create a strong school culture where students are trusted and, and are asked to take responsibility for themselves and for their peers and for their learning, then we can't get anywhere with teaching. And, and so um, the teaching has to reinforce that culture. So we were often training the teachers, of course, how to do project-based learning and they certainly were in the very, you know, new stages of it and certainly weren't very proficient. But a lot of teaching when you're using project-based learning is really about developing the self-direction in students and developing ownership in them. So it's not saying they don't happen together because the pedagogy reinforces the culture, but you have to really lay that culture down of trust, respect, and responsibility and that this isn't a top-down school that's driven by rules, right? That's the conventional high school. So, um, and the other reason why that's important is some people might call creating a strong school, school culture, some people might call it, um, you know, creating a strong, uh, a lot of people call it about, you know, a learning culture or an academic foundation, you know, but, but one of the best quotes, you know, and this is so relevant to you guys where you are with your, your grade level, is you almost have to kind of like hit the restart button on expectations for high school kids. They come in, they're not going to really expect they learn. They really see it as just kind of that transit station about whether I'm going to go, go to college or not, but I'm just going to stop my schooling sooner or either expand it somewhere else. So they're really in this transition phase. And then also they've been taught with really bad habits, right? So they've been in schools where they're taught to um, not be self-directed, where they're taught to follow the rules. And so the culture actually has to be disruptive too, right? To be like, they have to go, oh, wow, this isn't my father's Oldsmobile. This isn't like any school I've been to. So the strong school culture, you know, you can almost say is like, what are you signaling to your kids when they walk into your school? Are you signaling that this is a school that's about rules and, and lack of trust and that teachers are all omnipotent and powerful and, 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 and that they're mean and that they control you and that you have no choices? Is, is that what you're signaling? Or are you signaling that this is a school that cares, that this is a school that's focused on academic you know, learning, this is a school focused on college, you know, what are you signaling? And and you guys, you know, are in the heart of, of Chicago, so sometimes I still really hate when I go into high school, and the very first thing you see are all the ridiculous trophies that they've won for their multiple sports. And some schools have gotten good at putting some of their academic achievements up front, but what are you signaling when you walk into a school like that? You're signaling the cultural icon of high school is about sports and prom, you know? And so what are you signaling by the very attitude of people, but what do I see first when I walk into a school? You know, and so where, I was, where was I? Some school, they were so proud of their school, and I just had a hard time getting past the entrance because it was saying how great they were, you know, like a blue ribbon school, and then it was all sports stuff. And, and that's what they told me about how great they were, right? Um, I would prefer to have seen examples of student work or examples of, of, of um, how I know my students are learning or anything else. I mean, not to say they can't do sports, but, but that was the focus is our success is that we got named at Blue Ribbon School and our sports. Well, how did you get named at Blue Ribbon School, right? And it was test scores, you know, 
Or a lot of them, have, when you walk in, they have their test course published, right? So you can see how great they are. Um, so, so that's a good way for them to try to move to the academic effort. But what are you just signaling by just the very, uh, what's on the walls of the school? And then when it comes to, again, disrupting students' experiences, it really is about what are you going to do to show them that they have to be self-directed and that this is about them driving their own learning and this is about them becoming real learners and, and, and really intellects and scholars in many ways, right? Not just that you can pass a test and not just that you're going to turn your homework in time, but what signals to them you want them to be learners, thinkers, scholars, intellects. And so what a lot of the schools do in the book that you guys saw was they did these, um, they did these orientation programs that were purposely disruptive. And maybe you don't want to do an entire day of orientation or three days or whatever. And, of course, Casco Bay in the book is on the way extreme level um, in terms of, like, you know, basically doing outward bound the first week, you know, or actually it's about a month into school. But you can still do little rituals at the beginning of school. I mean, simply um, asking a student, what do you want to learn, is, like, revolutionary because kids have never been asked that. Ask students, like, what, what do you think you can help others learn? We don't ask students that because, again, that says they have value and they can contribute, and that's just not about the teacher. And so that's so those are kind of the key elements of the culture in that what are you signaling to kids, and, and then how are you going to kind of show them that this is different than where they've been and what they expect. But then also it's using, you know, it's, it's funny because it's a small piece of, um, of the description around school culture, but it's the power of using common language so that students have shared and common understanding of what they're expected. So if we're all using, like, so this kind of comes into academics too, but if we're all using different rubrics with different measures of success, like this one student at a school here in Marin, I had him show me his rubrics for his English class and his history class, and they weren't even using the same categories. Like one was using proficient, highly proficient, you know, whatever. Another one had different language to the rubric, the English teacher, than the history teacher. And then, of course, the how they scored a kid as proficient or not proficient was different as well. So how's this kid supposed to know what's common with regard to his learning expectation when his teachers aren't even on the same page? You know, they're not even using the same language. And so you know, the best example I saw was really Science Leadership Academy. I say that, but I probably don't mean that because they're probably just fresh in my mind. But I love their rubric because their rubric was the values of the school. So the values of the school was presentation, research, inquiry, right? And so in every single – so that was posted all around you know, the school so everyone knew that was the values. And that's how teachers talked. But they were also assessed on those values when every project they did – and so that's what I mean by, by common language. And so a lot of times when we think school culture, we think, are our kids happy? You know, it's kind of like those surveys you read, right? My kids are happy. They feel safe. You know, they feel someone cares for them. I, I'm like, you know, put that up on steroids. That's, that's your minimum. I want my kids to feel safe. Absolutely. I want my kids to feel cared for. But I want my kids to understand what learning is. And I want kids to understand how that learning is going to happen in this school. And I'm going to make sure that the very physical design and the walls and my language and my rituals all support each other in that. And so we're all moving in the same direction. It's not just one thing we do. It's multiple things we do to reinforce that. And again, that's where pedagogy does come in here, and that your pedagogy has to reinforce your school. So if you're telling students, we trust you, we respect you, we want you to be self-directed learning, but then you throw them in some passive learning environment where it's sit and get. That's not supporting your culture, right? You know, so so it, it, this is iterative, but they're still connected. So I struggled because I start with strong school culture, but I kind of wanted to combine one and two because number two is around the second condition is you know you have to create a strong school culture, but you know of trust, respect, and responsibility. But teachers have to function as professionals in a collaborative community. And so I thought, well, should I just call that culture? Are one and two really culture? One is student culture, and one is teacher culture. But in reality, to, to the point you guys made before and what we talked about, is teachers have to reflect what they want their students to be able to know and do. So they kind of come together. So it's up to you about how you think about them. But, but, but one reason why I made it separate is, again, is we're not purposeful and intentional enough 
in how we create that culture for our teachers to work in. And just like with students, it has to be a culture where they're trusted, where they're respected, and where they're taking responsibility for their own learning and for their own teaching. And so what one and two kind of add up to is collective responsibility for learning, right? And that we're all in the same space in terms of our thinking, our values, our beliefs, our vision for what kids know and do, and how we act here in the community. And part of that is that we're all taking collective responsibility for each other. You know, Monica is not Jen's responsibility in English, but, you know, she's, she's not, you know, Jen's responsibility when I go into math. It's like I'm always Jen's responsibility because we are one school and these are all of our students, not just my student, your student kind of thing. And you want students to think that way too. If I see my student, my, my friend hurting or help, you know, not doing well in a subject, how can I help them? So again, where pedagogy reinforces the culture is you see in a lot of the classrooms students being paired up purposefully um, by differences to have a stronger student help a weaker student or in groups, right? So I remember um, in one school, um, the teacher handed out a quiz, right? So, you know, again, traditional, and that's okay because there are some very traditional pieces of school we have to do to show that kids learn. She hands out a vocabulary quiz. Can't get any more traditional than that, right? Then she asks the students, who scored, let's say, I think she said 92 or, or higher on your vocabulary kit? Raise your hand, right? And then she says, okay, well, who scored, you know, um, below 80 or something like that? And they raise their hand, or maybe anyone who scored below 90. Well, sometimes we think, oh, my God, you're shaming kids. They're having to kind of out their scores. They didn't do very well in the vocabulary quiz. You know, so it's kind of taboo. But really what she was doing was saying, okay, everyone over here that got these scores, these are your group leaders. Go divide up around the room, and you guys go work with them. And you learn what their vocabulary, strategy, what their strategies were to learn these vocabulary terms. And so she's reinforcing the concept of collective responsibility for learning by teachers and students, right? That we're all in this together. Um, and she's also reinforcing it's okay if you're not doing well, you've got to lean on other people. And I'm not the only one that you're going to lean on. I'm not your expert here. I don't know what works for you sometimes when you're studying. Why don't you learn from Monica how she studies or what resources does she go to? So, so again, the, the community the culture piece still fits in with what happens in the classroom. It's not just what you do in the, with the school walls and the values and, and orientations or rituals. It's how you reinforce that in the classroom. So, so I'm probably still sticking on school culture because it's so important. But then teachers function as professionals is that every one of these schools, and this is the hardest thing to do, and I assume you guys have this or you want to have this. This is actually really hard. Kind of, They all had planning time together. And all of them, whether it was 45 minutes, whether it was two hours, whether it was 90 minutes, whether it was one day a week, whether it was every day a week, or whether it was um, a couple times a day, they varied, um, depending in many ways on the creativity of the principal and how they structure that time. And you know, some of them had to be really creative with the teachers union to, to get that time too. But that was just a non-negotiable. Our teachers will work together and they will have a minimum amount of time to work together. And, and so building that time in for teachers to work together and then structure how they work together if they don't know, you know early on how to do it, then you have to find ways to structure. So I didn't want to just call number two a professional learning community because I feel like that term's been so watered down because it's more than that because your teachers have to function collaboratively, but they have to function as professionals. But with that, they're going to have time to work with each other as professionals, contribute to each other's expertise, expand their expertise, but design learning together, but also, you know, understand and know where your students are and talk about that too if some of your students aren't performing well. So um, the, the other really key piece to the condition about teachers function as professionals and collaborative community, it comes down to the school leader. Does the school leader really share responsibility with the teacher in decision making? You know, do they really involve them in the decisions or is it they have a leadership committee that is that supposedly is involved in decisions but, but aren't. So all these schools had some kind of leadership committee that was truly empowered to make decisions with the principal. Now sometimes the principal would say, here's the three decisions I will always make. <laughs> you can never make these three decisions, but everything else is up for collective decision making, right? Um, they also had, if, if the most, they all had a pretty strong leadership committee um, that could be empowered to make decisions, but then they also had subcommittees, right? 
So particularly, they all had maybe a professional development committee, people who said, okay, I'm going to work with the students, I mean with our teachers, to know what their professional learning needs are, and then we're going to work with them to make that happen. Um, you know, or we're going to work with it to make sure that Monica is doing some like really amazing, innovative stuff in her classroom. And we're going to make sure there's time for her to show that to the other teachers in her classroom. So it's also kind of uh, celebrating and highlighting what teachers are doing that are innovative and creative and that you want other teachers to do. And there's not that stigma that he or she is, is out doing me. Because we're a collaborative community of professionals and we want to learn from each other. So, you know, what I really say is if you can't get one and two in, you can never move up this chain. Um, so that's kind of the big, we'll, we'll kind of stop there because um, sometimes it was frustrating for me when I ran New Tech to have to focus so long on one and two. We actually didn't focus enough on two. Um, we, we put structures in place when we kind of give professional development to the schools, but sometimes I don't think we were so clear in calling out what we were trying to create among teachers. Um, I'm sure they've gotten a lot tighter about that, but when I took over we were kind of um, transitioning the organization to do some things better. But we had to spend a lot of time on one, whether we liked it or not. We had to spend a lot, especially if you're going into a high need district. So I'll stop there and, and, and see if you guys want to share what you think you do that's really effective about creating this strong school culture where students know that they're trusted and respected and take responsibility for learning, but where they kind of know this school's unlike every school I go to. Now, of course, Crystal Ray, that's pretty easy. <laughs> Your school's unlike most every school. Um, so that's going to signal pretty loud. What do you mean I have to work? You know? Um, <laughs> You know, what do you mean I have to work to pay for my tuition? Um, so, so that's a pretty big signal there, um, which is probably a great example. So we could even start with Krista or Ray. But if you guys want to tell me where you see yourselves in this strong school culture in terms of what you think you do most that signals what you want your students to know and do and, and how you want them to interact in this community, why don't you guys just share with me? Anyone? Anyone? Um, I'll, I guess I can start. Yeah. So, uh, we've spent a lot of time over the last five or six years as an uh, entire faculty developing um, our grad, grad statement. Uh, so we looked at our, our goals as a Sacred Heart School. We looked at academic standards, and we came together and said, you know, what is it that we're trying to do with our kids? What would we be yeah. asking it? We developed kind of categories, and then from there we um, – incorporated language from the Sacred Heart Network as well as um, the IB Learner Profile to oh, nice. really articulate what that means underneath each category. And then yeah. departments have collaboratively worked to develop all of their intended learning outcomes that go underneath those categories. So everything they're right. doing in terms of instruction are tied back to critical thinker, problem solver, effective community. Yeah responsible citizen committed to justice and all the other we have six categories so um, everything we're doing academically is tying to that and then we've been talking about how do we use this grad at grad profile to also in uh, kind of influence what we're doing with our sports program or with our extracurriculars so that's kind of the next step I think, for us. What does grad at grad mean? Can you define uh, that? It's the graduate upon graduation, so it yeah. is um, what our students will be when they leave us, what we're working to ensure they become when they graduate. Would you have done that if you weren't doing IB? Yeah, we started the work before IB. We actually started it um, probably five or six years ago. And then probably what helped you get to IB, huh? Yeah, we, I don't think we would have been ready to even take that jump if we didn't start the work. And then what we realized was that, you know, the IB Learner Profile really connected beautifully to the grad, grad we already created, so it was a program that worked well for us. And then we just tweaked some language to show that we, you know, we didn't want to just adopt the, prof the learner profile from IB. We wanted to embed it into who we are and make sure that all the yeah. pieces of who we are work together. Um, yeah. So, now, I really like this idea of a learning profile, and I know, like, like um, you know, again, at, at Science Leadership Academy, that's kind of what their values are, right? It's it's a it's a profile of what their students should be able to know and do. Um, at New Tech, they use a um, when they first start working with the school, they said, "What are the learning outcomes you want to create?" Mm -hmm. But what I love about what you said is you're kind of putting it really individually and specific onto the student about learning profile, and that was re what was really clear when I talked to the principals. If I asked them what do you want your students to know and do? 
they would say things like, you know, well, I want them to be resilient. I, I want them to be able to um, be able to defend their point of view with evidence. I, I want them to be able to walk into higher education and ask a professor what are the course expectations and requirements. You know, I want them to be able to to be able to work effectively in a STEM environment. I want them to be able to, to um, take in differences and differences of opinions from people and and figure out how they integrate that in their own work. So everyone was so clear about what they want their students to know and do. And so I love this idea of a learning profile because then I'd go ask the students or the teachers from that same school, what should you be able to know and do? And they were all lockstep, you know, with with kind of the same language, right? And and so um, expeditionary learning uses the habits of work, H O W. Mm -hmm. And so it has some of these values too that are maybe more related to whole child or whatever term you want might want to give it or social emotional learning but again telling the students after you finish you know whatever this course or this assessment you're also going to be assessed on these habits of work but I like this idea of a learning profile because when I talk to people what I say is, is what do you want your students to know and do and if you can't tell me the five things you know then 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 you don't have a clear enough vision so it kind of takes us back to the vision comment and, and so a lot of times people will say, well, I want my students to go to college. Okay, what's it mean? You know, and so what you're saying is you kind of deconstructed that, you know. Or they say, well, I want my students to get good grades. Well, what does that mean? What does that show about learning? And that's why a lot of people have gone to standards-based uh, standards grading as well. So I, I like that. Are there other, um, so any other folks, if you have something like a learning profile or something that becomes as explicit as what we just heard about in terms of helping students understand what they are going to know and do in their school? Now, I was actually just looking at the deeper learning outcomes and thinking, you know, if, if a school did not yet embedded in there, like we want students who are self-directed, we want students who are good communicators, you know, I mean, they could potentially be used as part of that process. Yeah, so one thing I do, and, and I can send this to Jen, but it's, I, so when I do workshops with schools, I've start realizing how much they don't understand the six deeper learning outcomes and quite honestly I expected them to understand mastery of core academic content and critical thinking just because of common core you know that we least had gotten to those and so I've learned not to put schools too much on the spot when I ask them to define those two because they don't do a very good job and I think some people actually define critical thinking better than they're able to define how do you know students actually understand key principles, procedures, um, and concepts behind academic discipline. So one thing I do, and I'm happy to send this to Jen because I kind of created it for these workshops, is I list each of these deeper learning outcomes, right? And then I give a definition of what that is. And then you guys have to give me evidence of how you're developing that in your school. And um, because a lot of times we right. say we are, and then you don't really have any evidence of how you're developing that. And then that morphs into a conversation about teaching, right? Yeah. So other examples of folks who, who maybe use learning profile, maybe have a rubric that reflects um, the values or expectations of students, or if you guys even want to talk about any rituals you have in your school that support um, the, the, the culture of trust, respect, and responsibility. Any examples you guys want to give? I'm going to take my little laptop. We're going to the kitchen to get some water. <laughs> Are you thirsty? I was thinking about um, like orientation type rituals. Like what, I mean, when you have new students come to Cristo Rey, you must orient them to this crazy new environment. We have them for eight weeks. Our first eight weeks? We take them up to St. Mary's University for four days. Uh, we do all the jobs. Eight days or eight weeks? Eight weeks. So eight yeah. they spend eight weeks with us before they start. When? When do you have eight weeks? June. The whole summer, basically. June 20th to August 1st. Yeah. Big orientation. Yeah, that, that's, 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 like a, that's like a re, I don't know what you would call that, more than an orientation. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. They spend a week with their supervisors, so it's like an intense, you know, they're spending 25% of their time there, so. Uh, oh, on their job sites. So, okay. But in the, so they'll spend one full week working a 40 hour week with their supervisor as eighth graders come before their. Before the freshman year. Okay. 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 Uh, so yeah, there's a ton of orientation that goes on around job skills and 
Yeah, the culture piece is a huge piece of what we do. How are you orienting them to your school? Not just the workplace stuff, but what kinds of things are you highlighting that you bring? Because you also bring kids from charter schools, district schools, faith-based schools. You have kids coming from multiple sectors. So in how are you in multiple communities, right? So can you just move in a little bit? Yeah. So how do you orient them to the fact that they're going to be in a really different kind of place? Yeah, I mean, I think there's so I'd say all the eight weeks, four weeks is very academic focused, and for three weeks is job focused, and one week's all culture. Okay. What about at Shy Tech? Are you guys has your way that you orient students changed since you've been working with High Tech High at all? Or uh, unfortunately, no. I think we we set up core values for our staff, uh, but haven't done a really good job of implementing those. I uh, what we talked to with our school director yesterday, even. Um, but I think for students, it becomes a lot of like orientation is here are the rules of the school, here's what the expectations of our are of you, versus here are core values. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think there's an emphasis on like, you know, first week, probably like every place, like there's an emphasis on community building within the classroom and within advisories, but not as an experience that's external to, you know, what their everyday schedule would be when they start. You know what I mean? It's not something before school that we do. It's something that's that we just emphasize teacher to teacher and and it's autonomous with each teacher. It's not really like a grade level, like we're all gonna plan this activity, it's not that. So let me let me ask the question maybe a little bit differently. If if I um, if I'm a, a you know so um, I'm a freshman I'm coming into your school. How how do I know that your school? I mean again, Chris Ray is a little bit different. <laughs> um, but how do I know what's going to be expected of me, and how the school's different than any other kind of learning experience I've had before? Any other kind of school I've gone to. We uh, actually have what we call Freshman Academy. So first of all, we do a, a bridge program over the summer that kind of introduces students to um, our teachers and so they get to know each other a little bit. There's some community building, there's some academic stuff. But then we have what we call Ninth Grade Academy throughout, throughout the whole year. And it's a combination of a period where kids can do some homework and study and get help from teachers. But then there is a curriculum that spans it and it um, the curriculum is based around our grad grad profile that I talked about earlier that then takes kids through each of the different categories and explains what it is and then has them do kind of mini lessons that has them use the skills we think fall under those categories. So they can start to get the sense of um, what it is that we do here. And it also, there's a visual we use where it's like the Sacred Heart Golden Criteria plus the IB Learner Profile equals our grad they yeah. kind of talk about how those things influence. Um, and how long does that last? So the, the academy period is all year. Okay, they, sure. And uh, in your time. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the, the other thing is, is in some ways what you show, it, like it's called the academy, but that's actually how a lot of people use their advisories as well, right? Yeah. So if you guys have advisories, that's a way that you start signaling your expectations too. Um, and so you, ch you have certain check-in questions with folks or anything similar to that so that um, you're again teaching them that we're respectful here, we're responsible for each other. So that's, you know, do you guys have advisories or, or what, you know, again, how do students really know how your school is different or what's going to be expected of them for learning and for cultural norms? Uh, Monica, hi. Uh, so some of the stuff we've done at Sullivan, um, this is my third year as a principal, uh, through an exercise to develop some core values. So, <laughs> so our core values really come from our teachers, um, what they value the most. Um, and and then we, we've we taken those, we don't have advisories, actually they had voted advisories away um, the year before I got there. They had had them and then voted them out. What are some of the values? Uh, um, it's the acronym FIST, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Family, Integrity, Service, Tenacity. And uh, and then what we've done uh, of, of recent is, we, the first year, to be honest, we really just tried to drive those home with, with the teachers and the staff and the building to create that culture with teachers. And so everything we did, everything, every email or every conversation, I tried to relate it back to a core value through celebrations and concentrations. 
and asking for feedback through those core values from the staff as well. Uh, and then year two, we really started to take them to the kids um, and put them into like summer orientations. And then like in the first week of school, had teachers at each grade level sort of teaching those core values within their content area. So um, and sort of starting the year that way. And now we have and all boards. And we, have, we call them the ABC Awards, or kind of like a BET Awards or an MTV Awards, you know, at each grade level. And so then we celebrate attendance and behavior and coursework. So attendance, obviously, you know what that is, but behavior around those core values. Who is exhibiting those core values uh, at the student level? Uh, and actually, and then also we've done a couple times where we had students come up on the stage and give uh, core value awards to teachers. Um, uh, and, and, then, and then the coursework is obviously honor roll and high honor roll, but we also uh, highlight subject area all-stars. So teachers can call out kids that maybe not are on the honor roll, but are excelling in math, for instance, and, and maybe on yeah. subjects. So, That's a great example. So it's, yeah. it's very ritualistic. You know, it's every quarter, uh, and it's a time of celebration, but it's also a time to acknowledge the explicit things that we're looking for in our scholars. So yeah, yeah, you really, I mean, and you and and you know, you almost say like it's ritualistic, like eh, maybe, you know, kind of sorry, it's ritualistic. It, rituals are so important in these schools. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it just and and I think I have it listed under the examples for school culture. Is rituals go a long way in reinforcing those values demonstrating right the values just like what you talked about um, owning them so rituals are, are really important but I love um, everything you guys said so can you tell me so it's family integrity what was the other two service and tenacity and then do you guys <laughs> like spending time with those guys <laughs> what, what was that no I just said you can tell I've been spending time with those guys because it yeah, really. rolls off the tongue after a while <laughs> so then do you guys have um, so then I guess you guys have a definition of, of maybe what that looks like uh, you know what would that would look like? Yeah, you know, I think we have it more on the where we are right now is I think we have it more in the social emotional definition <laughs> side of things. But I'm hearing you talk this morning and thinking about okay, you know, changes are like five year to seven year process, right? We're in year three. Right. We need to start making the change of what those core values look like in the academic setting. Yeah, um, and that's going to be a big shift, and I think will really be an interesting shift for us. Um, yeah. I think the kids really believe in the core. If you hear what the kids talk about their core values. Yeah. And they'll email me and say, well, this teacher, he doesn't have very much integrity, you know, <laughs> things like that. But, um, but I don't think we've shifted this now. I think the, the half to the core values through their content lens and their and their subject yeah. area lens and, and then take that to the kids and, and see what that means within the classroom community. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because um, you know, you could do it either way, because I mean, like I said, it, with with Casco Bay, I feel like they keep their habits of work a little bit separate from their. I mean, their habits of work ends up being kind of a social emotional kind of resiliency piece to that, um, but and and kind of gets to some of these same things you're talking about in terms of community, but but I think it, it is great when they can be merged, but it doesn't. It, at one level, it doesn't matter as long as you're clear in your expectations, right? Which I don't think we are, and then you're clear in your language. So whether the kid was right or wrong about that teacher doesn't have any integrity, he or she has to at least define, well, what do I mean by that? Give me evidence that that person doesn't have integrity, but at least you're using that common language. And then you kind of test it out in terms of, are they using the language the right way, right? Give me an, give me an example of why that teacher has no integrity. I bet you that word, like in high school kids, right? <laughs> That's got to be their favorite word, right? You know. Um, yeah, I'm looking for everyone to have integrity. We're like these purists at that point in terms of how we want people to to to, uh, to follow their beliefs or whatever. So I think just the transparency, the common use of language, the rituals. I you know it all sounds really really exciting to me. And I know like um, this one King Middle School. I don't know if it makes it into the book. I think it's in the planning guide. This Gus, who was um, the engineering um, design teacher. He said, you know, just one year I just, you know, you have that one grade that's just so kind of unruly and not helpful or whatever. And he just couldn't deal with it any longer. So he, he kind of, he took basically the, the, the habits of work and he put it up in this really big, you know, kind of, he's an engineering, but it was on just white sheet, right? And a nice, like, graph and all that. And he would kind of start every class off that day going, how did you show the, or they'd have to end the class. How did you show these values today? Because he felt like he just had to kind of stop and make them reflect every day if they were really doing this because he was just going, you know, kind of back crazy. 
because he felt like he just could not get any control over his classroom. So imagine, instead of like, I have control, so what I'm going to do is yell at you guys, make you sit still and punish you. Instead, he's like, okay, at the end of the class, remember, you're going to have to give me an example of how you did one of these values today. And so that's just a very different way that you're working with students because you're getting them to reflect and own what they do and not do versus him saying you're bad, you're good. Right. Um, so I just wanted to jump in at this point a little bit um, in terms of the planning guide because I think that, um, you know, when I think of your schools and I think of schools that can schools generally, I'm like, these are schools that have a strong culture. These are schools where teachers are collaborating, but what I what I appreciate about the planning guide is that it kind of unpacks that, and not into a hundred categories, but into like four or five things. Because I might say that you know, like Monica was saying, you know, that the notion of students feel safe, students feel respected, like that's the kind of stuff I know I think of when I think of school culture. But the stuff that's in here is like about that. How are you immersed? How are students being immersed into? the learning culture and expectations. How is the physical space, you know, how are the core It's interesting because we're sitting in Phillips Academy High School, which is a turnaround school, and the school was the lowest performing high school in the state of Illinois, and when people first came to protest the turnaround, they were, it was because they were afraid they were going to take the trophies away. And, uh, you know, it's just, like, it's just, it, it's so much in the American mind about that kind of stuff. So it's, it certainly resonates where we're, where we're at here. Now you go around the school, you see stuff about student performance, you see stuff about attendance, you see stuff about awards, college, you see letters of kids getting into college. So, yes, there's still sports trophies, and they are the, now this, they were the state championship for their division, but, um, but they now at least there's a balance. It's not only the trophies, it's celebrating other things. Um, common language, I think, you know, when I think about schools that have strong culture, I don't think about it as the common language, but when I reflect back on, like, working at High Tech High, like, people thought we were robots because you'd ask someone a question, we'd all answer it the same way using the same words. Uh, yeah. It wasn't that we were robots. It was that right. the culture was so very strong that mm -hmm. we, we just used the same words to talk about the same things, and we all had a shared sense of what they mean, and so I think that, like, known well and supported by adults and peers. Like, I think that's the kind of stuff that our schools tend to be pretty good at. But some of the other kind of structural aspects of culture um, and how you orient people to the culture um, and how you, in, how you use student voice and how you value student voice, um, those are important things that don't always rise up in conversations of culture, which often focus on safety, you know, um, more environmental culture than learning culture. So. I appreciate that you provide an opportunity for folks to self-assess on those things because I was thinking about what Wes was saying about the kind of weak orientation process that you guys do. So maybe as a staff, you guys could look at this rubric and say, here's where we're at, and maybe that identifies as the weakest area. So then we'd say, all right, what are we going to do differently in the fall or in the summer to make sure that our kids are getting oriented to the fact this is going to be a different kind of place for you. And how can we involve students in that process? Because you have students who literally have experienced that change as students at Shy Tech. They yeah. came in and it was one kind of school, and now they're there and it's a project-based <laughs> learning school. I mean, it's, it's changed dramatically in the past two years. So, and it help you unpack that with your colleagues. Um, also, with the teachers function as professionals in a collaborative community. I mean, it sounds like you know, part of what I'm hearing you say, Monica, is that obviously you have to have the right people in the building who want to collaborate, who want to, who have the growth mindset. You know, I think all these guys have done a lot of work to get the right people on the bus and mm -hmm. get them in the right seats. But still, flattening that leadership hierarchy is, or get them off the bus. Exactly. No, exactly. But getting, flattening that leadership hierarchy really providing meaningful autonomy. Like, I loved what you said that, you know, our students are not going to feel empowered if our teachers are not empowered. And right. it just, it's like such a duh point at some level, but like, it just like hit me over the head when you said it today that we can't fake that. You know, if we give teachers fake autonomy, then they're going to give kids fake autonomy. It has to be genuine. Um, the role of teachers in PD, and then obviously teachers have time to work together. I think we all know that in order to have collaboration, we have to structure in time for it, but it's still a hard thing for people to find time to do, um, you know, to help teach uh, that kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning that happens in those collaborative environments. So, um, well, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, 
I took my instructional leadership team yesterday to an elementary school. We do little retreats with our instructional leadership team um, every so often, every quarter or so. And we typically go to elementary school because I want high school teachers to be inside of elementary school. And it's just interesting to like having somebody that you know go do walkthroughs or um, to talk to teachers or my teachers talking to teachers. And it's so the the conversations at the elementary school level are about pedagogy. At the high school level, it's about content. Right, and it was just really interesting. I, I keep hearing this sort of thing, teachers talking about teaching at the elementary school level as opposed to what their content is, right? And I think elementary school, I think the reason high schools are failing across the country is because we don't do high school like we do elementary schools, and I think that high schools need to look a little more like uh, elementary schools. From the classroom um, differentiation that's going on, also to the individualized learning that goes on, um, to the way that grade level teams work together, the way that um, so, you know, pre-K to third grade works together. The alignment, I mean, and it's just really interesting that, to hear you talk about that. Well, you're actually naturally doing interdisciplinary teaching in elementary school, right? Because yeah. you're multiple subjects if you're oh, elementary schools, you know? It's funny because I had to interview um, these districts here in California for this other project I was doing, and every single time I'd ask them, um, they were talking about Common Core and, and Next Gen Science Standards, but every time they say, well, it's much harder with our, our secondary teachers because they think they're experts and they don't want to work with anybody. But every single time a district would be like, oh, our secondary teachers, right? Because they want to be these experts and I am the math one. But what's so cool, like, um, you know, when you're like, especially, well, I, I think at all these schools, but, but you know, Jen would certainly say this about high tech high, but it could certainly feel us at Casco Bay is like, well, and, and Avalon, all of them. I felt like when I would leave these schools, I was talking to um, scholars, the teachers as scholars, right? Mm -hmm. um, because they loved their subject and because they were able to go deeper with this critical thinking and conceptual understanding and having students be self-directed and to, and to think about what they wanted to learn and how they were going to learn it, I felt like it enabled secondary teachers to be scholars mm -hmm. and to be true experts, right? And then to see these students, I remember this one student, uh, Dennis, my co-author, always laughs because he's like super smart. He reads everything, history, soci I mean, he's a sociology professor. But the student is talking about this book and this really in-depth book kind of comparison she did. I had no clue what she was talking about, some period in history, you know, and I'm like, oh, my God, if she only understood, I don't understand the things she's saying to me about this genre or this period of history. And it was just this really narrow point of history, I think, around the Korean War. I think God Dennis could track her, but like they're smart. They they, they create such intellects because again, you become you, you're you're turning on the passion of kids. So if you if you are are making your kids passionate about learning, they become passionate about that topic. You as a teacher get to be passionate again about your expertise, but you're not like I'm just an English teacher, you know, and that's all I do. Is you're you're doing this passionately with kids because you've turned them on to learning. Yeah. All right. I'm guessing that we probably more with you, Monica. Does that sound right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You kind of cut out for a second. You're going to wind down the next ten minutes, right? No, no. I was I was just trying to just have a sense of how much more time we have with you, and I wasn't sure if it was more like ten minutes or twenty. No, let's try more like 10. But I was going to add, so, so you know, Jen gave you guys a self-assessment. And, and, you know, I was thinking when we were talking is the self, the self I was thinking that like maybe you should either do the self, either before or after the self-assessment. Maybe just ask yourself that question I asked you. You know, how do your students know what's expected of them when it comes to learning and, um, and how they should interact within this culture? Right? So maybe you just need to ask yourself that first, kind of like this bigger, broader question. You know, because it took a while for you guys to think about that. And then maybe do the assessment because in some ways, you know, the assessment can seem artificial in that you're trying to fit into these categories that I created, right? And so there's a category on, on physical design. There's a category on, on common language. And so I, I, you know, kind of created these categories based on what I saw in the schools, um, but maybe you guys have, have different things. And so, you know, for, for example, I'm not sure, you know, we would have been able to say I, I have a learning profile, right? Um, I have the, the grad, you know, the grad of the grad profile, 
I'm not sure you would have maybe been able to capture that in kind of the rubric I created. Um, so maybe you guys need to start off with a big question about culture and then go in because mine, you know, is about kind of orientation. You know, mine's about how you're reflecting the school values, how common language is used, how students are known well, um, how, you know, there's a collective responsibility built into the school. I wholeheartedly agree with these categories, but, you know, maybe there's something else you guys are doing, and, and if you feel like you have to lock into this assessment, maybe you don't feel like you, you get to get to the essence of what you're doing. So, so I would say ask yourself a general question either before or after, and then use the rubric, but the most important thing when you do your self-assessments is evidence, right? And, and, um, and it's really fun if you do this as a team and you guys do it independently and you don't see what other people score and, and you guys are using your own evidence and then you guys actually have to reconcile to a common score. So if you find yourself completely off, you know, someone says, oh, we've had this systematized and someone else has a one, you're rarely doing this, then it kind of gets to Jen's point is that we know when people are on the same page or not on the same page. Um, and so, so, um, I encourage you guys to just kind of do some open-ended thinking and reflection on this and then think about some very specific examples because that helps you think about how to tighten things up in your school. What is that okay, Jen? What were the two questions you said, how do students know what is expected of them? And I feel like there was... Right, so how do students know what is expected of them when it comes to learning and when it comes to um, how they will operate in the culture of the school, kind of what the cultural norms are? Okay. Yeah, those seem like good questions to, generative questions to work with the staff and then yeah. potentially work through the self-assessment, um, you know, parts for one and two. Um, we have the opportunity to bring, uh, <laughs> bye Mary Rose, <laughs> or, bye Rose, yeah, um, that we have the opportunity to bring um, Monica out here to do some work with us face to face in later in the spring. So um, we do need to, and we can do some of this after we after you drop off. But we need to sort of figure out roughly when. <laughs> um, but also, I wanted you guys to um, share your thoughts about what would be helpful. Like if we let's say you are, have the opportunity to work through, um, if it makes sense to you. For you to work through, you know, some parts of the first one or two um, self-assessments. So around the um, strong school culture and teachers function as professionals, given that those are the foundational things that you have to have in place to get to the teachers as designer and the deliberate practice of the outcomes. Um, so we could have her. We could you could bring the data from your um, self-assessments, and then we could talk about where to go from there. That would be one thing that we could do. Um, there may be others. What I do you think, Chad? I have, I have an idea. I'm okay. throwing it out there. Sure. Um, just because I value this team here that we have you know, within school context. You know, have you ever done a person, uh, like a consultancy protocol? That that might be just um, helpful for us to take it to the take some things to the next level. I don't know if it's at this stage or at the end of the game of this year or what we're learning. But like, you know, after a self-assessment, identifying where we are and sort of sh sharing our story or where we are, and then sh sort of literally shutting up and listening to what you guys think we should do or some feedback on where we should go, and us sort of taking notes and calibrating those notes and, and sort of coming up with some actions of where we go. Because sometimes we get so locked into our container and we get we bounce against the walls because we know the people that we're dealing with that maybe these are some out-of-box of, out of type of thinkers here that would be helpful. I'm just not sure where it might fit in your scope and sequence of our learning. But this might be a place where it could. And so bringing you guys a problem that we're having or an area in the rubric where we're really struggling and getting some ideas on where, how we can take that to the next level. Just yeah, I would, be, I would be open to that. And I think what, what I like about what you said, too, is, is using the rubric, right? Because you know, one of the things I know that you guys, you know, Jen shared kind of a, a, a range of questions you all had. Um, on kind of where to get started, and and so um, you know one thing I said to Jenna is like these are great questions and they're real questions, but you it's hard to kind of work the plan and be methodical, and so if you can contain some of the questions within these four areas of the theory of change, um, I would be open to doing a cons uh, the kind of we'd have to figure out what protocol we want to use right for the consultancy problem of practice. I think that's that's really good. I, I think there's there's uh, the other couple things I think that what you're saying is. We don't want people to feel like this is the 
prescriptive way, right? This right. is the only way you can think about it, and hence why I'm kind of saying you might want to think about a, an open question. So we want to provide opportunities for people to self-assess and reflect, um, but we want to be able to put a, um, a process in there that kind of follows this theory of, of action, because I really do think it is purposeful that we had it sequential. And, and so, and you guys know this, as you've seen... You know, a lot of times, you know, and, and you know, Buck Institute does amazing, you know, PBL training, right? And but but sometimes that just helps a teacher in a school, unless they're doing it for a school or a district. But you're going straight to instruction, and 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 you're not thinking about the culture of the school. You're not thinking about whether the teachers are going to be in a supportive community where they can collaborate with each other. So that's the reason why we have the sequence. So I, I think we can do consultancy you now where your schools are based on these four areas. Uh, certainly, after you guys do the self-assessment, it can help us with a really great idea. So I think that's, you know, I'd be open to that when you guys start to structure your this. Yeah, I mean, I, I almost, sorry for the siren. <laughs> um, I was thinking about um, almost like looking at student work, actually. Like, if, mm -hmm. guys, like, let's say you have this generative conversation with your staff about sort of like how do kids know what's expected both sort of academically, behaviorally, culturally. Um, and then maybe identify, maybe not even do all of the pieces, but maybe identify the pieces of the, you know, or, or I mean, there are only like four, so you could probably do the full self-assessment of each piece or whatever, whatever made sense for your staff, gather the evidence, and then bring that together as a group, and then we could sort of like, you know, you could share, mm -hmm. here's where we're weak, here's the evidence or whatever, we could give you some feedback on that, and then maybe we could also do like something around a like a fishbowl on a specific problem of practice. You know, if this coincides with like when your next round of XQ stuff is due, <laughs> and you're struggling with a part of that, you know, maybe we could fishbowl it. You know, so um, so I think that uh, you know to the extent that folks feel up for that, I think that that might be a way to think about it, and then maybe it would be you know I don't know to you know maybe it'll be what is it now March. So, I know it's February now, so we would probably be February, March. looking at late March. maybe late March. When is, because our spring break, I know Chicago's really late. Late April. But yours is probably closer to Easter, I'm guessing. The week after Easter. The week after Easter. Okay, okay. Well, we'll figure it out, and I know, Monica, your schedule is booked crazy. Um, but we'll sort of maybe shoot for somewhere in that time frame. Um, and we could even have an interim conversation, you know, we, we could, maybe that could be not our next meeting, but our two meetings out. Um, mm -hmm. To uh, to kind of make sure that we're making progress on this, yeah. uh, that seems like kind of a like a yeah that it's not about being prescriptive, it's not about being lockstep through this process, but it is unpacking some of the elements around student you know school culture for students and teachers that that may not be so sort of obvious as the things we think of um, and some of the things we know the schools are already doing well. Right. Um, so I think that that actually um, feels like a good set of next steps. Yeah. And one thing you guys might want to start with, I'm going to just write myself a note to send Jen um, the six outcomes. But but one you know really good thing to maybe start with is that kind of um, exercise I was telling you is that you have the six outcomes listed, right? And maybe you keep some blank ones, you know, in case people want to add to these outcomes, right? But then you, you, they're defined, and then again, the, the teachers or you guys have to give evidence of how these outcomes are being developed. Um, so it's a little bit of like a needs gap, or is it kind of a gap analysis? So I'm just writing myself to, to send Jen the six outcomes, and I'm going to um, send Jen kind of this revised um, vision chapter I wrote, because after working with folks, I just realized that vision is more important than we than we. That, that, that I purposely gloss over vision in the um, planning guide because people don't really like dealing with it, but but I really think that that is the key. If I did made that actually the flaw. Okay. Yeah, and I, I feel like that expanded vision section to um, kind of just see where we're at and see what sort of bubbles up, and then next time we will um, you know bring bring some work to to have you guide us or do some do a couple little consultancies or whatever. Um, whatever, you know, makes sense based on what, yeah. what work products we're kind of developing. Yeah. And, I, and I think, you know, I, I'll just end with this, is, is like whatever plan. tools, yeah, whatever tools we end up using, um, it's really creating an opportunity for people to be reflective and to be honest. 
with what's there and what's not there. And that's really kind of what this first part of the planning guide is designed to do. Because again, sometimes we rush too much to the answer or we rush too much to planning this new initiative, but we haven't really given consideration of our strengths and our challenges that, that exist. And I'll guarantee you all of you have some strengths, right? right? And so it's trying to figure out how to balance those two. But, but the whole idea is really to get people to reflect on what you have and therefore what you can build upon or what you need to create. So it's both, right? Yeah. All right. All right. So with that, Jen, I guess I'll sign off. I suppose. Okay. Uh, yeah. We're sad to see you go, but thank you for your time. Thank you for your willingness to start early. Thank yeah. you for being you. Thank you for writing this book. Thank you for being my friend. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for involving me. And, and uh, again, we'll, we'll thank um, Hewlett for kind of giving me a little bit of flexibility to be able to work with Jen and, and her constraints. Because then she says she asked me early. Other folks didn't get it. <laughs> so, um, thank so thanks a bunch. And uh, we'll just kind of keep reading as well. Yeah. All right. Oh, wait, before you hop off, I just I just mailed you a Sullivan High School T-shirt you can wear to XQ on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'll say there's yeah, there's a school that's out there. I know I can't wait to see how they do this. So what's yeah. the next? After, when when do they tell you? Uh, I think we we get narrowed down to like 200, and by April 1st they're going to tell us that the that narrowed down 200. I guess there's like 2,000 applicants at this point. And we're going to be narrowed down to 200. April. Yeah, because they have like this, it'll be interesting because I think they have like 2,000 conceptual, like people present their conceptual idea or something like that, right? Yeah. And I think they're really anticipating that probably not all 2,000 are going to go forward with an application. Yeah. Maybe not. Yeah. It's a bad. So, yeah, so I'll be curious. But I'm sure you'll watch their tweets or their website because they're going to probably be, you know, giving those metrics out soon in terms of how many people applied. Because, you know, some people, you know, I mean, you don't want the whole competition to kind of go the bad small schools way of gates, right, in, in terms of not being enough support for these things. But I love kind of this crowdsourcing, grassroots, just trying to put some big ideas out there, you know, to get to inspire people, you know. So I, I hope it, it really does generate a lot of applications. I hope they put a lot of those ideas out. I have no clue what their plans are, but we just need people to have fresh ideas. So I, I hope they're able to take your ideas and promote them and say, and this, you know, just you have the range of possibilities that they're getting from educators like you. So I hope it's a really positive time in education, really do it for high school reform and innovation. Yeah. All right, well, congratulations on getting it in, and hope you get some sleep now over the next couple of weeks. So. Oh, yes. All right. Thanks, friend. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.